Okay, let's uh, go through Genesis. Last time I think we were talking about the deception of Isaac. And basically Jacob and the mother, Rebekah, were tight. And Isaac and Esau were tight. Isaac tells his son Esau, go out and get me some game that I love. Barbecue it up just the way they do in Tennessee. And then Jacob's mother overhears that and she pulls Jacob aside and says, hey, we're going to go in and deceive him. So Jacob gets rigged up with these uh, goat-haired things and he basically uh, goes in and deceives his father, who is blind, and his father grabs him and his father realizes, doesn't realize his wrong son. So he blesses, he blesses Jacob. Esau comes in then and says, Dad, you only got one blessing. My brother ripped me off. And, and Jacob seem, or Isaac seems to know that he's done wrong. And he says, no, Jacob is to have the blessing. And so Isaac says, no, the blessing needs to stay with Jacob. I will give you a blessing, my son, but, but you're going to basically serve your brother and that kind of thing. So you have this deception of Isaac and this parental favoritism, the father favoring one, the mother favoring the other, causing the sibling rivalry, and this Jacob's lie, his deception. And Jacob's name sounds like deception or heel grabber, heel grabber on the way out, but deception also, Jacob, sounds, uh, it's not from the direct root, but it sounds like a deceiver. And so Jacob deceives his father, which is really a bad thing. Um, and then seeking the power of the father's word. Now, what I'm wanting to suggest is that while Jacob lies to his father and he gets away with it, so to speak, does Jacob's lie have consequences? It has consequences for Isaac because Isaac, this guy is a blind old man and now he realizes everyone that he should be able to trust would be what? His own family. I mean, his wife. Can he trust his wife? His wife has betrayed him. His sons have betrayed him. And so now he's a blind old man realizing the people that are closest to him, he can't trust any of them. And so Isaac, it says, just was trembling, was trembling. He's an old, blind old man, and, and he's left without anybody to trust. Esau, what happens because of the lie to Esau? Esau starts plotting, saying, when dad dies, I'm going to kill Jacob for what he did. When dad dies, he's going to let it go until dad dies. But when dad dies, I'm going to kill him. And by the way, was Esau, was Esau the kind of person that would do something like that? Is Esau a hunter who goes out and kills animals and things like that? And Esau would do something like that. And so Esau starts plotting the death of his brother. Now, Rebecca was also in on the lie. Rebecca was the wife of Isaac. And what did, what with Ribka, or Rebecca, her favorite son is going to leave for 20 years, and she is left with whom? Her daughters-in-law, Esau, married two Hittite women, and Rebecca can't stand these women. Now, question is, have you ever seen a mother-in-law with daughters-in-law? Is that a problem? I just want to tell you right up front, mothers-in-laws and daughters-in-laws, is that a problem? There are all sorts of tensions can happen there. You've got too many women, what do they say, too many cooks in the room, too many women in the room, and like that. You've got loyalties for the son. Is the son loyal to his mother? Or is the son loyal to his wife? Okay, so you get this kind of thing. Um, by the way, I've often said, uh, you know, you're out looking for, you're out looking for a, a good uh, a wife, a woman. I'll say it from a woman's perspective. A woman's looking for a, a good man. Um, is one of the things you should look for for how that man treats his mother? No, is this, no, I'm ser serious. Is it, uh, when you're looking at a guy, the way a guy treats his mother, that's an important, that's important, okay? But anyway, so Rebecca can't stand these Esau's wives, and so she's going bananas because she can't stand them. Jacob has to leave for 20 years. He's going to flee to Haran up in uh, Mesopotamia, northern Mesopotamia. He's going to flee. He's not going to see his family for 20 years, okay? Even his internet service is going to be cut off. There's going to be no connection with his family for 20 years, basically. So are there consequences to the deceiving of the father? Were there consequences for everyone that was involved? Yeah, so this is a big deal. Now, what happens with Jacob? Jacob's going to flee because he's going to flee because he, his brother's going to kill him. And, um, and so he flees. Where does he go? As he's going, um, and let me just kind of, can I use this room as a metaphor? Okay, this room is a metaphor. This is Israel, okay? This, you guys are the Mediterranean Sea. Is the Mediterranean Sea beautiful, swimming 68 degree, sandy beaches, wonderful place to swim, Mediterranean Sea. You guys are Israel. These are the mountains of Israel. 
okay? Up there is the Sea of Galilee in this canyon, this canyon here, the Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, and I'm the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is about 1,270 feet below sea level, which means the water all flows into it. How does the water get out? It doesn't, it has to evaporate. When the water evaporates, 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 what happens? The sea turns saltier and saltier and saltier. So the sea of the Dead Sea, actually the Jews don't call it the Dead Sea, they call it the Salt Sea. It's 33% salt. Is that a high salt concentration? The oceans are what, about six or seven percent? Oceans, about six or seven, it's 33%. When you get in there, you float without having to, you basically can stand upright and you'll go about this high, this deep in the water, and you'll be like, just, you can go like this. When my mother was there, um, and this is hard, and especially on tape, but I know she doesn't have internet, so she'll never watch this, but this, this, <laughs> this, this, this fatter muscle float better? Okay, does muscle, have you guys seen, if, if a guy's totally fit muscle and stuff like that, what does he do in the water? Does, does it go down? Does he sink? Yes. Okay, fat floats. Okay, my mother goes in the Dead Sea and her legs came out from underneath her and she couldn't get her legs down to stand up. So they had to drag her over to the side and somebody had to stand her up because she couldn't put her feet down because it was so the salt. Okay, by the way, for you women too, do they do salt? They put salt on you to like suck stuff out of you, the bad stuff and things. So they have all sorts of, I think they call it ahava creams from the, from the Dead Sea. And you, you take these mud baths and stuff. It's supposed to be good for you and things. I don't know about that. But anyways, Salt Sea, okay? So salt, Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea. You guys are Israel. What country is this? Okay, it's on the other side of the Jordan River. This is the country of Jordan today. King Hussein, his wife is actually American, really good guy. King Hussein's good good king over there and stuff. But anyway, so this is Jordan, Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea, Israel, Mediterranean Sea. We'll come back to this in a minute. Where's Jacob going? Jacob is heading from down south. He's going up right into that region. And basically, he goes to the place called Bethel or Beit El. Now, when you look at Beit El or Bethel, okay, Beit El, what does El mean? You should know that by now. El means God, okay? El is a short form of Elohim. Elohim means God. El is a short form. So Beit means house of. So Beit El means house of God. Now, by the way, you guys know Beit because you know Beit Lechem. Has anybody ever heard of Beit Lechem? Beit Lechem? Beit Bethlehem? Beit Lechem or Bethlehem is Beit, house of. Lechem is bread. So Beit Lechem is house of bread. That's where Bethlehem comes from. So Beit means house of, and then they put different things on after it. So Jacob goes up there, and while he's there, um, this is where Jacob's ladder takes place. And let me just read down chapter 28, verse 12 and following. He goes there, and he goes to sleep. He's fleeing from Esau because Esau, he's afraid Esau is going to try to kill him, which he probably would have. And so he flees up there. He lays down. Do you remember in Sunday school where they tell you he lays down on a rock for a pillow? And he lays down at Bethel, and then he has this dream of Jacob's ladder. And uh, now let me just read through this. He had a dream in, in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of your father Isaac. I will give you, descend, I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Now, as soon as he said, I'm going to give you the land, what is this? Is this the renewal of the covenant? As I was with Abraham, and I gave Abraham the covenant, and what was the covenant of? That you would get this land, that your seed would multiply as the stars of heaven, and you would be a blessing to all nations. I gave that covenant to Abraham. I reiterated it to Isaac. And now I'm giving it to you, Jacob. And it says, I will give you the land of your descendants, and your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So that's the what? The land, the seed, and the blessing is again reiterated now to Jacob. So Abraham's God, Isaac's God, now becomes Jacob's God. Okay, and God meets him here. Now what's the thing with the stairway going up to heaven kind of thing? A lot of people suggest, and I'm, I think that this may be right, 
that what you have here is what's called a ziggurat. In Mesopotamia, do you know what a ziggurat is? You guys have had Mesopotamian history. and It's basically the one of those step pyramid things. And it's a step pyramid that's different than Egypt. Egypt had those slick pyramids that were, you know, rectangular and things. This was a step pyramid. And then in the front of it, there's a stairway that goes up to the top. And then at the top was the house of the God, so to speak, okay? And so some people believe that what Jacob is seeing here is a Mesopotamian ziggurat. The ziggurat was actually like a mountain. It was like the people built a mountain where their God could dwell at the top. And so God uses that imagery, God uses that imagery to say Jacob, because Jacob's familiar with that imagery and things like that. And so this Jacob's ladder may have been a ziggurat form. Again, we're guessing on that. Nobody knows for sure. I mean, we weren't there with the video camera or anything, but uh, so we don't know for sure. But it seems like the stairway going up with God at the top, that would be a, like a ziggurat kind of uh, configuration. So I want to suggest that this is when Jacob meets God for himself, and therefore there's this covenant renewal. And I want to kind of say that Abraham's God now becomes his God, and I want to suggest to you that Jacob leaving his family and meeting God for the first time, like he and God, um, that this is like the college years. Have, have some of you grown up in Christian families where, you know, your, your family goes to church, you're kind of a Christian family, and so your parents are religious, so you're kind of religious, but the question is, are you really religious? Then you leave your family and you go to college and when you get to college, can you kind of become whoever you want to become? And the question now is, it's not what your parents were or what your parents believed in. In college, it's what? It's what you believe in, right? And so in college, in a lot of ways, there's this differentiation where you become your own person. Where the, uh, I, say, I went to a, a secular university where they were basically, <laughs> I started to build up my faith. They were trying to tear it down, jam Nietzsche down my throat and stuff. And it was just like, and I had to decide, am I gonna, am I gonna, how should I say, still accept God and, and the principles that I grew up with, or do I become this kind of new person and explore all this new stuff that, you know, and things. And so I had to make a decision on those types of things. So in college, there's this really differentiation in terms of meeting God for yourself kind of thing. And so I think in many ways, Jacob going to Bethel is this kind of like this meeting of God for himself. Yeah, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, but that's not the question whether God is the God of Abraham and Isaac. Now the question becomes, God, is God Jacob's God? And so Jacob has to answer that question. He meets God here, and that's uh, kind of what happens. Now, Jacob in verse uh, 18 there, he sets up this memorial stone, and you're going to see that patriarchs, other people, uh, Moses, Joshua, these people, they'll set up these memorial stones, okay, to memorialize things. And and by the way, even till this day, do we set up memorials? If you go down to Washington, D.C., are there, are there memorials to this day? Has anybody ever been up to Washington Memorial, a really high Washington Memorial? And did you see that? They, they had an earthquake, and they had, some guy had a video camera up on the top of the Washington Monument, showing the whole monument start to move. Do you think that'd be real fun to be up on the top of the Washington Monument when there's an earthquake? And they just uh, they filmed that, and apparently they worried about cracks now in the Washington Memorial. Uh, Washington Memorial, okay? Washington Memorial commemorates Washington. I go to the Vietnam Memorial. Have you guys been to the Vietnam Memorial? Memor memorializing those people that died in the Vietnam War. My father would go to the Korean Memorial. There's a Korean Memorial they just built and things. And so you get, you know, as we, we put things, uh, there's a new, actually, and I haven't seen this yet, the Martin Luther King Memorial was just built. And it looks really pretty interesting. And so I want to see that when we go down next time. Uh, but uh, anyways, so we, we memorialize things in stone. So he sets up the stone. Now, by the way, is he going to come back here 20 years from now? He's going to leave. He's going to come back in 20 years from now, and he's going to come back to Bethel. And he's, it's going to be pretty interesting what happens here 20 years later. Now, in, down just a little bit in verse 22, let me read this. Now, Jacob made a vow. He said, if God will be with me and watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return in safety to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. Is Jacob making this conditional? He's saying, God, if you bring me back here, you know, and you give me food and clothes and stuff, then you'll be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. God's house. Do you get the play on words there? God's house. What is that? Beit El is what? God's house. Do you see how he's setting up the stone? He said, this stone then will be God's house. And there's this play on the word Bethel. 
and all that I, and that of all that I, you give me, I will give you a tenth. Now, where does this tenth come from? The law, Moses will give the law later on. You guys have read the book of Leviticus and other things that say tenth and things like that. Is there any commandment in scripture so far about a tenth tithe? And the answer is no. Jacob just seems to know to give God a tenth or a tithe. By the way, did Abraham also pay Melchizedek a tenth after the battle with Sodom and Gomorrah and things? So it's just pretty interesting. Both Abraham and Isaac or Jacob seem to know about this tenth, pay his tithes. He says, when you bring me back here, I'll give you a tenth of everything I get while I'm gone for the time. 